It is our last episode of the season and pants today, hella optional. Run it back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Woo! Happy Monday morning, our final of the season. Hard to believe it has come and gone so quickly. Gentlemen, I'm going to say good morning to you all. Is everyone feeling peppy and happy and excited to say goodbye at the end of this bad boy? <laughs> A good oh, yeah. Taylor. Oh, right. wow. There it is. Stadium insider Sham Sharania, Chandler P, coming from almost what looks like the same place, kind of creepy, and Eddie Gonzalez from his his home on the East Coast. And guys, I, I thought we were going to come in here today and just sort of go down memory lane and laugh, and we will eventually, but then NBA never, ever takes a day off. So much happening over the weekend, and we get started with the Bradley Beal <laughs> trade. It seemed to be so quick, Shams. Tell us how it went down. So last week when Bradley Beal and the Wizards began working on finding him a trade because the Wizards clearly moving toward a rebuild, um, they started working together on finding him a home. The Phoenix Suns aggressively went after Bradley Beal. I'm told from James Jones to Frank Vogel, their new head coach, to Matt Ishbia, to Josh Bartlestein, their CEO and owner. Um, And then you have even players. I'm told even Kevin Durant, Devin Booker recruited Bradley Beal. There were conversations with both Beal, his wife, Kamaya, and at the end of the day, the Phoenix Suns end up getting Bradley Beal, a three-time All-Star, for a handful of second-round picks, a couple of draft swaps. They trade away Chris Paul, as well as Landry Shamit, who did not have a future long-term with that organization. From a talent perspective, it's a no-brainer. I think the only way this deal happens is because Bradley Beal has a no-trade clause. That's literally the only reason he wound up in Phoenix. So Miami, Milwaukee... Sacramento. There were other teams even besides those. I'm told that made bids, made offers and Washington, I'm told, had better offers on the table. But at the end of the day, Bradley Beal got the pick his choice, pick where he wanted to go. And now you have Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Brad Beal, DeAndre Aiden. They have $160 million committed into those four players. It's going to make roster building difficult. You're going to really be limited just to minimum players. Um, but this team is all in on a championship. Clearly, and that goes from Matt Ishbia, James oh Jones, to Frank Vogel. Above all else, this team is all in for this next season to win a championship at any cost, clearly. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of jokes over the weekend of, of maybe we all get a shot to play coming off the bench for Phoenix. But look, as far as the trade itself, Chandler, who are you giving the better grade to? <laughs> uh, it's, let me... Let's really think about this trade for one second. And and I understand the no trade clause was a huge deal breaker here and they wanted him off the books and they're going into reset and tank mode. But you mean to tell me this is the best you can get for Brad Beal when Rudy Gobert just got five first round picks. Paul George got seven with some swap picks. Chris Paul, I think, got two first round picks in 2019 with some swaps. And, and this is what you get. You, you send him to Phoenix for basically dead weight and, and some a few second round picks. Uh, it's a brutal trade for me. And I understand this is hard with the with the with the with the no trade clause. And Brad had a lot to do with this. And obviously he wanted to pick. But you don't want to send him to Miami for Lowry and Duncan Robinson and actual picks that you're going to and players you're going to use. There's no way Chris Paul is going to go to the Washington Wizards and play. Uh, Landry Shamit is is the kicker on this trade. Like it just it really doesn't make sense to me. And I understand that they're tanking, and I understand the reset, and and this guy's trying to build this team like Sam Presti is in Oklahoma City. But I think the real winner here is, is Josh Bartlestein, which who don't know is the CEO of the Phoenix Suns, who's the son of Mark Bartlestein, who runs Priority Sports, who's Brad Beal's agent. What a father on Father's Day that this guy just did for his son because <laughs> this could arguably be the worst trade I've ever seen going from the Washington Wizards side. Um, but listen, good for Brad Beal. If I'm him, I would have rather went to Miami, but yeah. you, you, you load up with those two guys and Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. Uh, they obviously need to get a bench here, but it's, it's a great start, and I take those that trio over any other trio, but... They won this trade and it's not even close. I don't know what the Wizards are doing. Uh, that is the thing, Eddie, as Shams mentioned it, that Miami was on the board, Milwaukee was on the board, Kings were on the board. Bradley Beal going to Phoenix. What would have been the better choice? Are you good with him going there? I'm obviously picking Phoenix. I mean, to be serious, <laughs> honest. out of all of the situations, I think Miami is right there 
Milwaukee is very interesting, but this is a lifestyle choice. This is a, he had a no-trade clause. He got to pick the city. They're all great opportunities. Sacramento would have been a great opportunity, depending on the package they give up. But it, he's closer to home for his wife and their children. Uh, it's, 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 it's not all the ruckus you get with Miami. He, p- he picked Phoenix. He picked a great basketball situation as well. And, again, uh, shout-out to the ball scenes, and, and I'm sure that made communication easier for them. But this was all about the no-trade clause to me. He controlled everything there. I'm sure the Wizards wanted more first-round picks or first-round picks at all. I'm sure the Wizards wanted more assets they could play today. I'm sure the w- Wizards wanted a much better trade. But the fact that they gave him a no trade clause a year ago when they when they put him into this contract, they did not have to do. He was eligible for it. He's the only player with a true no trade clause in the NBA. He created this entire situation for them. This is a player who many people around the league were waiting for them to trade for the last three years. It was it was when he was expiring, when he was coming up on a Supermax, when it was time to sign the Supermax. Everybody was assuming they would trade him. They would get him out of town. They would they would move on from that situation. Everybody knew they were not going to pay him thirty of uh, sixty million dollars in four years, and they still did it. They did it all anyway, and they gave him no trade clause. And this is what the result of all that. And you know, this is their prize. You, you play silly games, you get silly prizes. But as far as the fit, I think he's a great fit in Phoenix. I think. Look, obviously, like Sean's mentioned, they have a ton of roster spots they need to fill. I think they have five contracted players as of right now, and you know, some fr- some free agent holds and the rest of that. But they have to fill an entire roster with essentially nothing to do. And the second tax apron, nobody knows if it's this year, next year, whatever. Either way, they're up against it. They can only spend so much money. Uh, very curious to see what they do going forward. Everybody's wondering if they're going to trade Aiton and turn him into two useful mm-hmm. players or ideally three. They're strapped. But you get those three players who can create the baskets they can create. And this is the team that got the closest to the Nuggets. There's no banner for that. They don't have a parade for that. But they won two games versus the Nuggets down two starters. There's something there with Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. And now you have Bradley Bill, who can also handle the ball, who can also play make for that team. They have a great foundation. Yes, they have to fill the rest of the roster. But this is not a bad situation at all for Brad. I think, I think he picked the best option of the four. That is some good agenting, by the way, to have all of that in that contract and be the only guy that had it is Papa Barlstein doing doing a good job. Look, when they added Kevin Durant, um, the odds for the Phoenix Suns last year went up really, really quickly. Uh, Now they've added Bradley Beal. Are they title favorites, Chandler? Well, it depends what they do with that bench that the guys just hit on, right? Like they have the be- we're saying they have the best starting five. We don't even know who that fifth starter is. Is it, <laughs> is, it is it a Kogi? Is it campaign? Do they find a way to get CP3 back there and, and take less and take a buyout or get waived or whatever that situation is going to look like? But yeah, you immediately become the best trio in the NBA. And basketball wise, I can't think of a better fit between these three guys that can all create all knock shots down when you hear Devin Booker talking about last year he's never had this many open looks when KD got there oh he's gonna get even more now because now you have another creator another shot maker Brad uh, Brad Beal can really stretch the floor here and he's a guy that we haven't talked about a lot because he's in Washington just just not getting any love there this kid is a hooper he can create he's strong he is one of the better shooters in the NBA uh, and and this they're going to present a lot of challenges to defenses this coming season. But it, it, it is this is where I'm I'm assuming they're hoping to get some veteran guys that are going to take less money and and, and kind of make that bench what it's going to become. Because you see this year, you need to have a strong bench. You at least need to go seven eight deep to to give these starters a rest. And you got to factor in injuries and you got to factor in foul trouble. And right now they have zero bench so it's going to be interesting but yes this makes them a contender this makes them the best offensive team in the nba this makes them the best duo the best trio however you want to look at it they are right there to to compete but they're going to have to really you know level out their roster shams that that's that's the question they have no money seemingly left for a bench and a lot of questions at point guard do you have answers to any of that well, we can start at point guard. I think right now you look at this roster, Devin Booker, you think you would assume is going to play a much bigger role at point guard. I don't know if he's going to be the starting point guard, but definitely being a ball handler, main ball handler, but really him, Brad Beal, Kevin Durant, they can all ball handle, initiate the offense, get other uh, you know, teammates involved. They can make other players around them better. So I think they all have the capability to do it. I would look at Devin Booker, though, as the guy that can actually do it full time, potentially 
at that point guard position. But I think even bigger than that, right now they have DeAndre Ayton on the roster, and I, I think there's a pathway for him to move forward and be that fourth option for them, be the starting center for them. Uh, but I'm told the Suns, even in the aftermath of this trade, they've been getting calls on DeAndre Ayton, and I think that is a market. We'll see how that develops. But right now he's there, and I think this trade did at least give them flexibility. You keep him, uh, or you, you could move uh, as well if, if, if the right opportunity, the right fit, you get multiple players, could come back. But I mean, I'm curious, going back to Chandler, like you played on a few star-studded teams. This, this trio, can you, like how, there's only one basketball. How, how are these three guys that have been ball dominant, have been scores, how do they make it work? Well, I think Brad Beal is the perfect guy for that, right? Because he is an unselfish player. He wants to win now at this point. He's been losing for his entire career in Washington. Uh, he's never had another co-star, let alone two co-stars like this, where he's literally the third option. You go from the first option to the third option. That's going to be <laughs> difficult at times, but knowing him, I know him very well and I know his family. Uh, you know, obviously he's a gator. He, this guy, he, he's ready to win. That's all he hasn't really done in his career. And, and I think he's a perfect fit. I think when you have Kevin Durant going ISO and you have Brad Beal in the other corner and, and Devin Booker in the other corner, it, 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 there's no just magic philosophy on how to stop this. And what I like about these three guys, they all try to defend and they all have potential to defend. So it's not like we're just talking about this offensive juggernaut. These guys can have the potential to be very, very good defensively too. Um, so, I, I, listen, I think it's great for him. I think, again, I think Bartlestein had a lot to do with this, and there could have been a, color, a couple other situations that were just as good. But you go now, we're talking about being a contender. So we'll see what happens, but the bench is going to be huge. I'd love to see Chris Paul come back here. I think he would be super valuable at the, this stage of his career. What he brings to the table is exactly what they need, a floor general, a facilitator. If there's a way to make that happen, I would do that in a flash if I was Ispia, but... Yeah, you're looking at uh, the best trio going into next season, and it's not even close. There are so many opinions floating around not right now about CP3. They were before this trade. They are now after this trade. What happens to CP3, Shams? For, for now, the Wizards are going to try to see if they can flip him to a third team. And I think a, a couple teams to keep an eye on, the Clippers, the Warriors, those are two teams that did discuss potential deals. Uh, with the Suns prior to this trade going down. And there was also another construct, from what I was told, where John Collins would have ended up in Phoenix. Chris Paul could have ended up on a third team like San Antonio or Houston, uh, from, from from what I was hearing. Uh, but the bottom line is I think this trade was a win for Chris Paul. $30 million guaranteed for next year. Rather get that money guaranteed than being waived outright, which would have only guaranteed him $15 million. So he walks away from this season, from next year's salary, with at least thirty. million. Point eight million dollars um and now <laughs> wizards are gonna see it can we go get a second round pick from somewhere uh could we get an asset could we maybe get a young player that we like so i would expect that process to, to continue over the course of this week hey eddie cp3 best fit anywhere where are you putting them i think the clippers are the best fit for him and a reunion there if he's hoping for it and, and that's a team that's obviously been mentioned is great for him I think that's where she'd be. All the contenders could, could, could benefit from having Chris Paul either starting for them or coming off their bench. I think the Heat are very interesting, and they have other things going on right now to, to figure out. But I, I also think the Warriors are very interesting. And then everybody wants to hear the one team that he didn't go to in 2012 and now 11 years later, maybe course corrects, the Lakers, I also <laughs> think would be a great fit. Chris Paul can shoot. He can run an offense. He can defend point guards when need be. And he's, he's a floor general. He gets your offense going. He's still a good player. Was he a $30 million player? I don't know. But if you're getting him on the vet men because he got bought out, that's different. What I am wondering, though, if you're the Clippers, do, don't you just play chicken just a little bit and dare the, the Wizards to keep him going into the season or cut him going forward? Why give up $30 million in salary to match that trade and bring him back when you can wait and maybe get him for the vet men and slot him right into your team? If I'm one of those other teams, I'm waiting to see what happens with that. Ooh, that's not bad. I like that. Chandler's nodding. I like that. That is some some cutthroat agenting going on right there, Eddie. Well done. <laughs> or GMing, I guess. Uh, so we thought it would happen Friday night. It happened a little earlier in the day, but we finally got some jaw news, Shams. How did we get here? 25-game suspension for John Morant. That's 30% of the season. He's going to lose about $8 million without pay. He's going to rule him out for the major awards, MVP, All-NBA. Um, and, and 
there also will be a reinstatement process that he's going to have to go through. There's going to be a process, conditions that the league is going to want to see him fulfill before they lift and let him get back on the floor. But one thing with that is I'm told John Morant will be fully a part of the reinstatement process. So really it's going to be upon what initiative he's going to take um, to make sure that he lets the league and lets everyone know that this time around, it's not going to be like what it was before. Remember in March, he meets Adam Silver, tells Adam Silver, won't happen again. Like, seemed very contrite uh, with everyone, very open, very honest. And then two months later, the same thing happens. And I think now, like Adam Silver said, basketball is going to take a back seat. There was a Denver club incident. There was an incident in Indy uh, with the laser pointer with, with people in his camp. You have incidents in Memphis. Uh, then you have the twice in, in three months incident with, with, with the brandishing of the weapon. So uh, John Morant, the Grizzlies, the PA, the league, you know, planning to work together and hopefully see him back on the court sometime in December. I mean, I would start with the dropping the narrative that was a toy gun. That might be something in the right direction. That's stupid. Uh, but 25 games, Chandler. We had so many guesses. Everything from that to the full season. How would you feel about what they ended up on? I, I think it's somewhat fair. I think it easily could have been more. And and when you look again, when you look at the loss financially he's had, it's, it's major. And we're talking maybe $50, $60 million total. With the 25 games automatically eliminates him from the all nba the mvp um the eight games last year and and, and this puts the grizzlies in, in a real in a real struggle to start next season but it, th listen this this is such a situation where this it's not the suspension that's going to fix john Morant. it's not the loss of money it's not the fake therapy rehab he went to last year in florida it, this is him looking in the mirror and becoming a man and growing up and changing on his own and realizing that I, I'm a role model. I'm a father. I'm so much more than what I'm portraying on Instagram. And I agree. I think coming out and saying the gun was fake is, is bullshit. And I think that he's again, just deflecting and he's coming up with these excuses of what really happened. He needs to own this. He needs to change. He needs to grow up. He needs to get new friends. There's a lot of other things that he <laughs> needs to do that are going to help him personally, which will help him in his career. And like Sean just said, basketball needs to be a backseat for him right now. He's got major changes mentally and spiritually or however you want to look at it, but he's got to change because he is in the midst of ruining a, 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 a crazy career and potential that he has that is life changing. Uh, and he's blowing it. So it, it's just going to come down to him and if he wants to change. And if not, we're going to see the same thing again and we're going to make the jokes and the memes and this kid's career is going to be over and it's going to be very, very sad. But I think this is a fair suspension. I think if something were to happen again, which is even crazy to say, I think he's done. I think there's no way a team can touch him. I think he's out of the NBA. But, but this is a good start, and I th and I hope he figures it out because he's such a talent, and he's so good, and he's one of the top three players in the world that are must see TV. But he's ruining his career, and he's ruining his life, and he needs to change. And I hope he does. Right now, he's building the documentary you don't want to have as a professional <laughs> athlete. Like that's that's where we're headed. That is the path right now. One hell of a documentary, but not a good one. Um, Eddie, did you expect something bigger, or was twenty five games good for you? No, it's a carefully crafted NBA suspension because it removes him from all NBA contention and, and takes the Supermax off the table for him and gets him back in time for the biggest NBA day of the year, which is Christmas, and knowing they just got smoked by the NFL last year and the NFL wants to have <laughs> NFL games on Christmas again this year. So, yeah, they, they did it exactly how they want. But I want, I want to echo what you said, Michelle, before we get over this. The fact that their defense was it's a lighter like, that makes it all stupider. That doesn't make it better. It makes it dumber. You're flexing a lighter gun? Like, that's your, that's your thing? Like, you look way worse. You look 10 times worse. You should have just said it was the biggest gun in the house that we had or whatever. To say it's a lighter, like, you're, now you're dumber than you were before. I, I'm so irritated by that. So I'm with you, Michelle. That was, that was ridiculous. Thank you. It's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Drop those stupid excuses and figure it out. Um, big news this week, of course, is... Thursday, it is the draft and the rumblings of possible big time trades ahead of time are happening. Shams, what can you tell us? So, I mean, the thing that I definitely have my eye on are the New Orleans, New Orleans Pelicans. And we spoke about it last week. They wanted top two or three pick to go get Scoot Henderson. Well, they get Scoot Henderson, you have to 
uh, to get. And I think, you know, two two guys for sure that you have to think about. Brandon Ingram, Zion, those are the two types of players, the, the archetypes of guys that can go get you a top pick. Uh, the Hornets, from what I'm told, they prefer a guy like Brandon Ingram over Zion Williamson. So we'll see between now and Thursday. I don't think the Pelicans are there quite yet. I don't think they've made formal offers yet, but clearly there's interest in getting a top pick, and we'll see what transpires over the coming days. Do we like this talk, Chandler? I mean, look, I feel like they're close. I feel like this is a team that we were talking about with the futures bright beginning next year, with the with the players they have, with Zion healthy, with Willie Green. Um, and it feels like it's just a bit of a step back, kind of unloading Brandon Ingram or Zion and and going to the future with a guy like Scoot, who can possibly be very good. Uh, but as, a, as far as a win now, I, I think it's the step back. But listen, if, if this kid's going to pan out to be as good as people think, then 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 why not? But if I'm them, I'm not ready to give up on Zion yet. I would rather put in Ingram in that trade than Zion because he's shown us when he's healthy, which is rare. Mm. He's a 10 player in the NBA, but it's interesting. I, I can see it going either way here. And, if, and for your Mariah Mills update, she has tweeted already this morning. I just want to make sure I do my job as a journalist. Shams, we're going to take a quick break uh, with you. We'll see you later on at the end of the show. When we come back, we got to figure out which teams already are hitting the panic button to figure out a way to beat the reigning champ Nuggets when Run It Back returns. What a great day to celebrate a championship, but we're not done yet. We some greedy bastards, baby. We some greedy bastards. We're getting another one. And I'm out. <laughs> and I'm out. Uh, there was fireball. There was there. The parade had a little bit of everything. I was I was a big fan. Yes, that was the Denver Nuggets head coach, of course, Michael Malone. Michael Malone. Um, and he said they're greedy and they want more. And now it's time for everybody in the West to hit the panic button to figure out what do we do? Well, we're gonna start with the Lakers. Are you hitting the panic button on the Lakers, Chandler? Before I answer this, J.B. Bickerstaff is my favorite coach. This guy is a close second. <laughs> really off just his interviews and his parade and how drunk he was. <laughs> this guy is incredible. Uh, the it. Lakers, slightly I am. Listen, at the trade deadline, they gave me some hope last year that they made some good moves. They got younger. They got talent. They got shooting. The only problem is their two core guys are LeBron James, who's aging and is going to be a year older, and Anthony Davis, the same thing, who always seems to be hurt. So, yes, I'm slightly panicked just because of those reasons, but but also you are the Lakers, and you do are going to get free agents, and you have the biggest market, and so there's always going to be light at the end of the tunnel. And, again, it depends what they do this summer, if they're able to re-sign these guys. Do they bring D'Angelo Russell back? Do they re-sign Austin Reeves, Rui Hachimura? They have a lot of unanswered questions, but... I, I think they can put together a contending team next year uh, with what they currently have. But yeah, it's a little scary knowing that you're everything. LeBron is is possibly on his last year there with the whole Bronny situation looming and where he goes. And, and you're really banking on Anthony Davis to be fully healthy for a year. So I, I am slightly panicking, but they still have a little bit of... I'm going to go the other way and slightly not panic. Uh, wow. I... I, I they had put together a roster this year on the fly that was championship level. And yes, they got swept by the eventual champions. I understand that. But matchups are everything in this league. And, and the, way, the way they handled the Warriors was very impressive. The way they handled the Grizzlies, who was a contender all year long, was very impressive. There's a good team in here somewhere. I made their case last week uh, under Frank Vogel, who is obviously coaching the Phoenix Suns. But I'll make it again. Anthony Davis and LeBron James were proven playoff performers. Anthony Davis may be the best defensive player in the league. He was absolutely ridiculous this, this postseason. It just so happens that Nikola Jokic is also equally ridiculous, if not more, on offense. Mm -hmm. And that's what you end up with. But they put together a nice roster against them. They have some flexibility. They're going to be buyout market favorites. And they have LeBron. They have LeBron. And if he can remain healthy, if they can figure out a plan to get him as healthy as possible going into the playoffs, we can, we can see what they can what they can do. It's tough to pick against him in four out of seven games. It's just tough to pick against him. So I'm not hitting the panic button just yet. They do have to add some pieces, but everybody does. The Denver Nuggets have to add some pieces and figure out some stuff. They're probably losing Jeff Green. They probably losing Bruce Brown, despite what they said at the parade. <laughs> so they have holes they have to fill as well. So everybody does. The Lakers just as well. I think Darvin Ham's a really good coach. I think they will find answers. And they will be a contender going into next season. 
Now they have to keep Bruce Brown. When you're drunk on a stage in front of a lot of people, that counts. That is true. Yeah, you got to stick around. There's, there's no way around it. Uh, Eddie, you can just go to the Warriors, who have been just sort of a bizarre story for the last season. Uh, what are you doing with them? Are you hitting the panic button? It's a team I am hitting the panic button on. A lot in flux out there in, in San Francisco. They lost their longtime GM, president, w- whatever his title was, he was running everything. Uh, they slot in Mike Dunleavy, who's been a huge part of what they've done, but does not have the experience that Bob Myers has. They have an entire roster to figure out. They have a schism right in the middle of their roster with Jordan Poole and Draymond Green. Really, Jordan Poole and everybody, it seems. And they have, a, they have that major question they have to answer. And I would not be surprised if there are a lot of Draymond Green and Jordan Poole suitors this offseason. So they will have the opportunity to actually make that decision, to let to let Draymond walk, to find somebody to trade Jordan Poole for. But they have a lot to answer there. They have a lot of depth situ- issues there. It sounds like uh, Jonathan Kaminga is on his way out. Ton of turnover. So in, the, in that sense, with that much turnover, I'm going to say, yes, I'm hitting the panic button. But uh, this is coming from the guy who all year long said, I'm not worried about the words. I'm not worried about the words. And then they lost. So uh, do with that what you will. Uh- I, we were. I would think I was with you too, Chandler. Are you hitting the panic button? Yeah, I am, and and I, it just feels like everybody is getting better and everybody's getting younger, and this is this team, this era is is on the downslide. And I was panicked the minute that punch was thrown. I think that's something that's not fixable. I think the chemistry, the morale in that locker room is lost. Um, I think they've got to move one of those two guys for them to have success next season, or this is just going to be looming over there. It's going to be the black cloud, uh, cloud over them all season long until they figure that out. But again, I'm panicked, but they still have that dude right there and they can ride him till the wheels fall off and he's going to lead them to the playoffs next year, no matter what they do. And then they're going to be in the hunt because Steph Curry is that good. Um, but yeah, they, I'm panicked because they have a lot of decisions to make too. Mike Dunleavy has never been in this situation before. I love him. I think he's going to be great, but he's got decisions to make. Do they pay Clay? Do they pay Draymond? Do they get off Jordan Poole somehow? Are they going to give up on Kaminga already? Um, they already got off Wiseman, so like the kind of their future pieces, one of them's already gone. So uh, I'm panicked a little bit just because again, everyone seems to be making moves. Everyone's getting better, and this team is kind of stuck in the mud, giving up their assets and getting older day by day. Who would have thunk it that we'd be here with this Warriors team? So, so many questions. Let's go to Dallas. Chandler, you know I'm starting with you here. Panic button time for the Mavs. You know I'm not panicking here, but you have Luka Doncic, who is <laughs> arguably the top five player in the NBA. You have a chance to lock up Kyrie Irving. I am, I'll tell you this, I'm panicking like nobody's business if they don't re-sign Kyrie Irving this summer. I don't care the hoopla that didn't, didn't work. They're going to re-sign him this summer, and then they're going into next season with a strong duo and uh they still have pieces like jaden hardy josh green they have those assets that they can look to get rid of and to add to their team or something like clint capella deandre ayton i could see be a fit here um but it's just it's classic mavericks this team they need a makeover they need to change some things up they need a new arena i hate their jerseys like they, there's so much God. stuff that be doing differently it and sounds it's like a panic too, man to me it's too good of a market it's too good of a city i don't know how they miss out on big free agents every summer uh i i love the dallas mavericks i love dallas it's such a great town but they, they gotta change something needs to happen because you're you got luca for this window right now and it keeps getting smaller and smaller um but no, I'm not panicking because of that reason. You have him, you have Kyrie Irving, you have assets. They have a lot of bad contracts. Bertans, Tim Hardaway, JaVel McGee now is looking like he got overpaid. So they do have some contracts that need to get off of and handle. But now when you got a top three player in the NBA, top five player in the NBA, I'm not panicking quite yet. Are we Are we panicking that, uh, according to Mark Stein this morning, or I guess yesterday, that nobody else wants Kyrie Irving? It doesn't seem like there's a market <laughs> at all. It helps, it helps like Dallas. Maybe they can that's save gonna some That's going to be another dough. bad contract. They're going to be stuck with another bad contract. I, that's, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, Eddie. Tell me I'm wrong. Good old Mark with some uh, pro Maverick spin. <laughs> never would have, never would have thought that would come. Uh, I, I'm not hitting the panic button, and I'm going to echo Chandler a little bit here, and I'm going to add add something to it. Uh, I'm not panicking because they have Luka Doncic. I'm also not panicking because they have Mark Cuban. And Mark has shown over and over and over 
that he will do whatever it takes to be aggressive in the market and to try to field the best team possible they can over there. So he's going to keep building around Luka until he does not have Luka anymore. And if it's under his control, he will always have Luka until Luka retires. So he's going to keep building that roster up to try to make some contenders. Remember, this team just went to the conference finals a season ago. So it's it's not like I know they ended up in the lottery kind of by choice, but it's it's not like they they just fell off a cliff and they're just some awful team. They had a ton of injuries last year. Obviously took a stab with the with the Kyrie trade and 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 went on from there, but I I'm not panicking. The West was so in flux this year. The West was such a mess. It would it would not shock us next year for them to win 55 games and be right there in the thick of it. They just need to add a few pieces, much like the rest of these other teams, and, and they'll be competitive in the market, so I'm not panicking. Okay, let's go to Los Angeles. The other team, the team with so much potential, the Clippers. Panic button time, Eddie? Yeah, I'm in a constant state of panic when it comes to the Clippers because of their yeah. injury history. And Kawhi looked like he was the best player on earth for a month. And played one and played a, play, a playoff game and a half. And it's unfortunate because you 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 say what if so much with this team, and you wonder so much with this team uh, that 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 you can't help but be that way going into the season and going into the playoffs, no matter what they do. Kawhi and PG could play 82 games next year and look like the two best players in the world, and I would still be panicked going into going into the springtime. So I, I am panicked. I think they should be hyper aggressive trying to get Chris Paul because he would help them a ton. They, they need to figure out their point guard situation. I know they've talked a little bit about bringing Russ back. Uh, I, they have a roster with a ton of tradable pieces, and I expect them to do be very aggressive going forward. And uh, everybody's whispering about Bob Myers maybe next year when Bob Myers comes back to basketball because Steve Ballmer's pockets are endless. Uh, mm -hmm. So I am panicking with them, though, and it's because of their health, and there's no way around that. Yeah, that, that, what, what he said. It's It's... <laughs> Think about it, the Kawhi, he gave us a little taste too last year where mm -hmm. he was back. Like we were like, and, and it's still, it wasn't enough. And it came to an end. And there's not one player on their roster under 25 years old that I'm in love with, that I, that I love, that I can build a future with on this team. It's like a staple for the Clippers going forward. Everyone's movable. Everyone seems to be older. Uh, and the same situation as the last time we just talked about. Everyone's getting younger. Everyone's getting healthier better and this team is kind of stuck with these two guys that can't find ways to be healthy that are extremely talented that are awesome when they're when they're healthy it's just a big if they're hell is a big question and it just then it always seems to be no they're not healthy so yeah i'm worried but again it's la it's a huge market they're always going to be able to come and get players but the, uh, the, there, there's no real future here with this team looking at it besides the free agent market of having the possibility to get other players it's crazy to say all that out loud. It is absolutely crazy. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, time to head out east. Is it panic time in Boston? When Run It Back returns. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Oh, that button is scary. It's time to head out to the east to figure out who's hitting <laughs> what. Uh, Chandler, we might as well start with Boston. Are you hitting the panic button on the Celtics? No, not yet. But it, one more finish like this season, and, and uh, you know, not a great start next year, and and firing Missoula, then I'll start panicking. But no, you have Jason Tatum, you have Jalen Brown, two absolute stars going into their prime that can play on both sides of the ball. Uh, a great culture. They always find a way to get these players like Derek White, Marcus Smart, Grant Williams. They're going to create a team that's deep. They're going to create a team that's defensive minded, that's tough. Um, and, and these two guys in Tatum and Brown are a special, special duo. Um, and we just see with, with the Nuggets, when you get a duo like this and you kind of create and fill out that roster with, with the guys that know their role, can shoot the ball, can defend, they're going to have success. But no, this is a team that's going to be right there next year in the hunt to win the East. And I'm not panicking quite yet, but that, that, that's not saying I can't. That's not saying you know, another year like this, another finish, uh, not a good start. Then all of a sudden I'm panicking because it's another year that feels wasted with this duo where they just didn't get it done. Yeah, I, I'm right there with Chandler. I, I'm holding my hand over the panic button like like a game show. Like I, I'm waiting <laughs> to hit it instantly. But with those two guys going forward, I, I have to have confidence with them too. They're, they're the two most important positions I think in the sport right now because they defend at the on the perimeter and they they handle the ball the way they do. 
really can't bet against that as far as the future of a team goes. They've been conference finals, finals, conference finals. They, this is what they've done since they've got into the league. But they do have a lot of ton of questions to answer over there. One, I think the first question to answer is their head coach. And they, they've seemingly hired his replacement just in case. Uh, Al Horford is not getting younger. They have Grant Williams, who will be, un who will be a restricted free agent, who they need to figure out if they want to retain him this summer. Uh, the the, the, the Jalen Brown contract, obviously, is a situation that they have to look into. And, and with him hitting all NBA, he's eligible now for Supermax. And they're going to, that tax apron will be there for them going forward. And it will make roster reconstruction more and more difficult as they go further along with those contracts. They have a ton to figure out. But I'm not hitting the panic button just yet because I think those guys are as great as advertised. I think Jason Tatum's a top 10 NBA player. And if you have a top 10 NBA player, you compete for a title just about every year. So I'm not hitting it just yet. I feel like the hand is touching the panic button, but we're just waiting to exert yeah. any pressure. That, that's what, it, yeah, I feel like I'm with you on that one. Uh, how about Milwaukee, Eddie? Is it time to hit the panic button on them? No. Uh, look, I know they had that tough loss, and, and I'm going to go against my uh, agendas here and say that was no regular eight seed. I mean, that was the previous one seed from the year before who suffered a ton of injuries, and they went to the finals. You lost Giannis in the middle of that series. Now, I still think they had ample time to come back and win that series, but that's a whole other argument for a whole other day. But as long as you have 34, you are a contender in this league, and there's no reason to panic. What you need to do is continue to put a great roster around him. They need to figure out, they, I've, they should retain Brooke Lopez if it were up to me. Chris Middleton sounds like he's coming back. Uh, they seemingly waved around Drew, Drew Holiday and the Brad Bill trade. They're going to be aggressive, but as long as you have Giannis, you're going to be great. They were the one seed this year. I know they flamed out. I know it was historically bad, and I've talked as much mess about them as anybody else. But they were the one seed this year for a reason. They need to figure out the fringes of that roster just like every other contender does. But as long as you have Giannis and you have him in MVP form, there's no reason to panic. You agree? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, look, this is arguably the best team all season long. This is the number one seed. This, is, to me, is who I had winning it all. And I still think they may have won it all if Giannis doesn't get hurt in that series. And I think they're just, when they build around Giannis and they get Chris Middleton back, and I agree, I think guys like Lopez and Holiday and Portis, these guys are so valuable. This team on paper is a championship team. They just got to retain these guys. They got to add a few more pieces. But this is, again, this is kind of like a Boston Celtics team where they're tough, they're versatile, they defend, they have shooting, they have scoring, and they have a really good duo, arguably trio, if you want to throw Drew Holiday in there. So I'm not worried about them at all. They're going to be right back and, and home court advantage next year, no matter what they do, no matter what the other teams do, they're, they're going to be a top four team in the East next year. So I'm not, what are we panicking for? Okay, I like, we're very chill in the East so far. How about a team that's already made a change? at coach Chandler Philadelphia panic button time yeah I'm panicked because I don't know about the hiring that they just had I always have questions about Joel Embiid's health and uh, he's coming off the MVP season where he was great the foot always bothers me he's getting a year older he's he's massive uh and then you have <laughs> the James Harden situation looming right where is this guy coming back why are all these reports even happening is does he want to be there and I feel like when there's rumors like that, where there's smoke, there's fire. And I don't think those would be getting out because he could easily just come out and say, I don't, these aren't true. I want to be in Philly. I want to play with Joel and B. We have a, a bright star in Tyrese Maxey, but it just seems like this, this, it's in a little bit of disarray. And when you look at the Eastern conference and it just seems like the, even the heat or uh, the, the Celtics, the Bucks, they're just, they're, they're more stable. It's, I don't really know how to explain it, but Yes, I'm panicking, although they do have Joel Embiid coming off his best year. They do have a young star in Tyrese Maxey. Just seems sloppy, and it's in, and, and it makes me feel weird, and I'm panicking. <laughs> makes it feel weird, yeah. Eddie. Yeah, I'm slamming the panic button. And I'm very curious <laughs> to see, I'm very curious to know if they had got involved with Brad at all, if they kicked the tires on that. Obviously, look, the Brad situation, very particular with the no trade clause, but they should be all in on mm -hmm. Brad. They should be all in on Damian Lillard. They should be all in on Chris Paul. They should be all in on any point guard they can get, especially if James Harden walks, obviously. But even if he stays, like, you need to figure out a, a more, a, a better situation, a better team fit for Joel Embiid, the MVP. And I think all of those guys are a better fit. The uh, Damian Lillard, Tyrese Maxey backcourt makes way more sense for Joel Embiid 
than, than the fit with James Harden. Same thing with Chris Paul. He, it, Brad Bill especially, I, that would have been a dream fit for me if I'm looking at that team. But they need to further build around Joel Embiid. And I think that's probably the plan going forward. But I would be in consistent panic mode if I was them because it's, it would be nothing for Joel Embiid to be the next superstar to go, okay, now I want out. Now I want to be in a better situation. Now I want to be in Miami. And there's always murmurs and whispers around Joel Embiid, another Drew Hanlon guy, by the way, who should jump out and say, it's time, I'm, I'm out of here. And they're waiting on James. They're, 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 they've always had the Tobias contract that they've waved around over and over and over. Yes, I, I think constant state of panic out there in Philadelphia because it is getting real close to put up or shut up time for them. I know it's going to be so much fun. This offseason is going to be great. How about the New York Knicks, Eddie? Of course, I'm going to start with you. Panic time? No, they, they just had the dream season. Like, they, yeah. they went to the second round. Nobody expected them to do that. They have a new star of their team in Jalen Brunson. They have Josh Hart, who's like the heart of their team. Uh, mm -hmm. No, there, there's no reason to panic. I'm very curious to see if they try to ship Julius Randle this year or R.J. Barrett now that he has his contract. But, no, there's no reason to panic. They're upward trajectory. Uh, they, they, they took a game off the heat. They, they, they had a great season. They're, they're moving up. This is what they needed. This is the, the, the trajectory they should have been on. Um, as Jalen Brunson continues to grow into his role even better, I, I think he'll be an all-star next year. I think he should have been one this year. It's all fun and games out there in New York right now. And now, if we get another year or two down the road and they start turning into true, real contenders and people want championship expectations on them, that changes the energy now. But for right now, everybody's just enjoying whatever the Knicks can give them. And, and a second round playoff run, that was great. It's, it, it's, it's great out here right now. If you ship yeah. off an all-star in Julius Randle, is that considered panic or just strategy? Mm. Strategy. <laughs> yeah. He's like one of those all-stars that's a very good player, but you're okay even as a fan to give up, right? You always feel like there's something better out there than, than, than that. But no, I can't panic. <laughs> They, they, they just overachieved. They just beat the Cavs, who was, was a favorite in that series. They got Jalen Brunson. Um, no, I'm not panicking yet, but I am kind of just because I know I'm still a step behind, right? I still going into next season, unless they make drastic changes, I know I'm not competing for a championship next year. This was a blessing even getting to the second round this year in the Eastern Conference, let alone having to go through Boston or Philly or Milwaukee or Miami. or uh, There's probably other teams, but... No, but again, this is the Knicks. They have the money. They're going to create the space. They have the market. They sh they, they deserve a real superstar. Um, and who knows? Maybe they can get off Julius Randle. Maybe they can get off R.J. Barrett. I'd say they're not getting off Jalen Brunson. That's their guy going forward. I would even add another guard. I would take Dame Lillard with Jalen Brunson because then go two guards if I had the opportunity because they need a star um to go with Jalen Brunson and then add around those guys but uh, no I'm not panicking they're coming off a successful season wow the Eastern Conference other than Philly seems to be very chill very smooth things are going well there I like this for them uh, well done guys uh quick break time and when we come back we are running back the funniest moments of season one of run it back and stuff from the court uh-oh run it back <laughs> Run it all, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all, run it back, run it all, run it back, run it all. This is run it back. Prime. Jokic? Prime. Dwight Howard. Oh, Prime oh. Dwight Howard. Oh, all <laughs> day. All day. Every day. I feel like I'm looking at twins. I mean, this really just feels like some sort of uh, a 23 and Me moment. You didn't do anything else on Twitter. Do you have a response now that it's been some time? What's, what's that thing Draymond just said where he said, uh, Insecurity is loud. Yep. Right. This is your safe zone. Well, well <laughs> George Carl first, first and foremost. <laughs> but I would have beat George Carl up that day. Not choking, I would have beat him up. You're probably not uh, even a third star really on a good team because if you were, the Lakers would have kept you. I'm sending my best to that family and, and, and Mrs. Harden, but she was talking reckless to me. I could watch my French Bulldog get ran over by the mailman right now, and I would not react like that. It's arguably the worst take I've ever heard in media in, in my life. It's okay. Shams is in the line. <laughs> sure, is, uh, uh, we have a special correspondent within our organization who shares shares information. With All I'll say is, I, you know, I got bodies everywhere. I got spies everywhere. So. <laughs> Watch it shows like Run It Back. 
to Zeshan Sharania and Eddie Gonzalez. Kim Kardashian, three Lakers games in a row? Why? The only time ever I, I paid a Venmo debt and I was like, what's your Venmo? I just yelled at him. Give me your Venmo, Chandler. Just give it to me, all right? There was this viral video about you getting banged on in high school by some scrawny white boy. Would you, would you like to comment further on that or should we just leave it at that? The story is true, but there's no video <laughs> evidence. <laughs> I want him to tweet my death. Like, she is dead. She is no longer breathing. Mother, it's like, just all matter that. of fact. No, we don't, we don't want to. Well, I'm going to die. Get over <laughs> it, Shams. We're Let all going to die. Good. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Chandler Pants. Yes? Never. Okay. Nope. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs> Yay! Shams is back with us for our final segment. Um, I still can't get over Kenyon Martin. That's still that second, that moment. You guys all, we were Great shocked. We were shocked. Yeah, I know, right? What a season. Um, what a season. Guys, what a season indeed. Like, so we're running out of time. Before we go, we want to we want to do our funniest moments of what has been a very wild NBA season. Chandler, we're going to start with you. Your funniest moment. I got to go with the LeBron reaction. <laughs> Still to this day, um, it's unbelievable. And I think now LeBron fans, Laker fans, they can see the humor in this. Right? Like can this I is, and I know I made a very jokingly <laughs> comment about my dear French bulldog after this, <laughs> but I stand, I stand to it. This was a <laughs> unbelievable reaction. Look at this angle. This one is what really kills me. I mean, this, it, it's just too good. And if you don't see the humor in this, I don't like you anyways. So whatever. <laughs> this, this is really, really funny. Yeah. <laughs> He's not dramatic at all. That was just an outlier. Um, I mean, good Lord. <laughs> good Lord. Uh, Eddie, do you have a, you have a funniest moment? I feel like there's so many to choose from. <laughs> Minus from the same day. <laughs> Oh, wow. It's Pat Beverly with the camera, which is like the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever seen in NBA. Shout out to Eric Lewis. And then the quiet Shout tech, out. the quiet tech afterwards. Look, you, there you go. You're out. So it's worth it. I just totally. love it. It's so perfect. And he points back. Like, this is, this is, yeah. The amount of people who cussed me out for calling LeBron dramatic when he was very obviously dramatic. <laughs> I'll hey. never forget that day. Like hey, the Lakers don't think are just hilarious, don't, Tim. Don't, don't think for a second Eric Lewis didn't go to his burner right after. <laughs> now that we know. <laughs> yeah. That makes me so I happy that it was him. Know. It all comes it makes full circle. the whole incident funnier. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, sh Shams, do you have a favorite that that is sticks ridiculous. out? <laughs> I mean, th this one was nuts. This one, this one was nuts. And here we have. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. This oh, wow. Is, I mean, you're all time. Room. Um, <laughs> yo, look at look at this. Yo, what oh, is going? On? What, what, what is, is this? this? Yo, hold on. I saw this. I was dying laughing. <laughs> what? Is this? Why? I know they call him Guap. I know they call him Gucci. Guap. <laughs> <laughs> yo, Guap. Why, <laughs> Why is he dapping up fans? Why is he dapping up? What does this? I'm like, yo, what are we doing with the NBC? <laughs> I don't even remember I lost, that. I lost it. I still can't. I got tears in my eyes right now. I can't. I can't. I can't. Oh, that's a good one. I don't even remember that happening. That yeah, was that it was was that during the game, or <laughs> after? <laughs> yes. TV I've never time seen, out. I've never seen that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> like where? Uh, why? Look at Gua. Cool <laughs> He's I'm having the time of his man. life. <laughs> That is ridiculous. Okay, fine. My my funniest uh, favorite moment, especially now that we have the benefit of hindsight being 2020 and what has happened since, is this audacity of LeBron and Giannis to ignore this man, arguably the greatest planet player in the world right now, however you say that. And he drafts himself because he didn't want to be last. That is to me. And then he got the ultimate revenge by crushing everybody. My favorite, my favorite. That's a boss all. move right there. That's a boss oh, move. I, boss. He, he, I was there. Yeah. I saw him stand up. I'm like, what is going on? Like he's drafting himself. Never. I mean, I, I don't know if we're going to get a draft again next year, but never seen that happen. Yeah, it's a good oh. point. We might not get a draft again next year. Guys, it's been an absolute LeBron pleasure. I've it enjoyed too. it. He, I mean, yeah, as if he was <laughs> laughing. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I cannot wait, hopefully, to get to do this again next season. Shams, I feel like your job's just beginning while the rest of us take some time off and enjoy a little bit of the summer break. Happy draft week. Guys, let's stay in touch, especially on our secret thread that the bosses don't know about. Until <laughs> next time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Run it up, run it back like a running back. Yeah. She knowing all over the map, cause she make it clap. 